members of the Lapham family. I think if this case screams out anything, it screams out the fact that mind-altering substances are not an answer. Learning to live life on life's terms, embracing grief, processing it, is critically important. You know, there's an adage out there that says that hurt people hurt people. That's what happened here. This is something that did not have to happen. And unfortunately it did. Ms. Jones, in my opinion, you have been shown a tremendous amount of grace from Jameson's family. Very seldom do I have victims stand up in court and seek anything but the absolute worst for the perpetrator. And yet I heard both his mother and his father expressing their forgiveness to you. I'm so thankful that they have that firm foundation of faith in which to proceed and to move forward. I was given two bits of advice from my parents that have served me extremely well. The first was when my first child was born. And my mother told me that every day is a gift. We don't know how long we have them. Every minute, every second of every day with our loved ones is to be cherished. Because, as has been so poignantly expressed here today, we don't know when our last goodbye is our last goodbye. So I encourage the Lafferty family and all those impacted by Jameson's death to reflect on what a bright, shining light that he was. And how your lives have been changed for the better because he lived. To focus on that thankfulness piece, the time that you did have with him. Because life is about choices, and you can choose to focus on the negative and the fact that his life was snuffed out way too early. Or you can shift the focus, be thankful for the time that you had with him, and do all sorts of good things in his memory so that that bright light will live on forever. Ms. Jones, after my family experienced uh, very debilitating loss. And I said to my dad, how are you doing? How are you holding up with this? He said, you know, I found that the quicker you accept things, accept responsibility, and do your best to make amends, that that's really the only thing that can be asked of you at this point. It's clear to me that you are genuinely remorseful for for the loss that you caused in this family. And as Mr. Navis pointed out, your life has fallen far short of what we would want for somebody in our community. You have never experienced your father's protection and strength in your household. Having been victimized multiple times in various manners. And then losing your own son. You certainly have experienced life <coughs> most difficult experiences. <coughs> but unfortunately, you didn't do the work that was needed to process that grief, the hurt. And unfortunately, it's resulted in more grief and hurt. But what you can do moving forward is to turn from substances, recognizing that they only make things worse, and embrace a life of doing good in doing it in his memory and in his honor. And I thought as I was preparing for this sentencing, very seldom do we hear in the media from a defendant who has terminated a life. Um, do we hear of this person going on and doing good things in memory of that light and that life that was ended? And that, yeah, that's something that you can do. You know, this is a time for accountability. And this court was faced with a, a decision early on when I met with your attorney and Mr. Lowe in terms of fashioning an appropriate sentence that would hold you accountable, that would 
never ever begin to replace this man's life, but would hopefully do justice to him and to his memory and all that he was to his loved ones. There's been a suggestion here that you have life without parole, and clearly that is not an option to this court in terms of the offense that you pled guilty to. And it was important to me when I met with counsel to afford the family some sense of assurance short of going through a trial. Because that too is devastating and wreaks such an impact on families and communities. And so when I had met with counsel and after I had an opportunity to hear from Mr. Belay and, and Mr. Nave, I had indicated that in the event that you were to enter a plea, that the court would cap your sentence at three quarters of the maximum to give that assurance to the family and to you as well so that you knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, there has been reference here that you should plead guilty, but yet from a legal perspective, it's clear to me that you were in such a sense of distress on the night that that occurred and living your own pain under the influence of substances that you do not have the proper recall that would be required for this court to be able to accept a guilty plea from you. Coming in here today, accepting responsibility and apologizing to the family, I think is the very next best thing that you could possibly do for this family to give them hopefully some semblance of peace and the strength to, to continue to persevere each day without James and Andrew McLaughlin. His full name. So Ms. Jones, it will be the sentence of this court on count one that in failing to stop at the scene of an accident when at fault resulting in death as a habitual offender third, that it will be the sentence of this court that you serve 12 years to 15 years with the Michigan Department of Corrections without any credit for time that you've served in jail since your arrest in light of your parole status. On counts two and three, which will be consecutive to count, or excuse me, concurrent to count one, but also consecutive to your parole sentence, you will be required to serve Fifty-seven months to ten years on each of those counts, counts two and count three. You will be required to pay restitution in the event that the family submits any restitution requests that have not been received to date, but the court will leave that open to them. <coughs> there is a crime victim's assessment of $130, $550 in court costs, $2,000 in a fine, $400 in attorney fees, and $68 in state costs. As it relates to counts two and three, there is an additional $68 for each count for a total of $136. And again, restitution will be reserved to Steve Lawrence and Emily Hatter, the parents of the other victims who have not spoken here today, but whom this court is very mindful of have been impacted by your actions forever as well. So Ms. Jones, you do have, in light of the fact that you entered a plea in this matter, you don't have an absolute right to appeal, but you do have the right to seek leave to appeal within 42 days from today's date. Mr. Relay just handed Mr. Nave that advice of appellate rights if you would initial where he is directing you in the legal file that reflected you as an advisor of your appellate rights. So 144 months in terms of the clarification, that being 12 years. So in this matter, in closing, again, I wish the Lafferty family 
I'm sorry, what are those discussions? You said 12 to 13, correct? 12 to 12 13. 13. I'm sorry, yeah. let me correct that, yes, 30 years in terms of the maximum. So what that means is that the minimum is the amount that you will be required to serve after you complete your parole sentence. And it will be interesting to see what the parole board does with that in the sense that you are still in the midst of that sentence. So this sentence will not begin until such time as you are released on that parole sentence. So it will be uh, up to a maximum of 30 years. So obviously your conduct and the choices that you make in prison, the people that you choose to align yourself with, um, will have a direct impact on how much of that 30 years you serve. So I wish for you that you choose to live your life differently, to do good things so that evil doesn't prevail here. And so that the light of this young life will carry on and the, the memory of the good things that you do in his honor. Thank you. That concludes the proceedings. Thank <laughs> you.